Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this uh, Global Health Forum. Uh, the Global Health Forum we do about once a month, usually on the uh, third Thursday of every month. Uh, the plan for these is to bring people together with interest in global health who come from different parts of the college uh, and who might not otherwise talk to each other. Uh, it's a big place on many campuses. Um, I think this is the first time that we've had a big input from the mathematicians and the engineers, so that's really uh, excellent. Um, so the way that we do these things is that we have some speakers. Uh, we'll have a bit of time maybe to answer a few short questions after each talk if there are matters that you want to clarify. But otherwise, uh, we'll have a question-answer session at the end, so save up your questions for then. Um, this is uh, sponsored by the uh, Institute, which you can see here, of Global Health Innovation, uh, which brings together a number of research programs, uh, and we're very grateful to them for managing to put this on. It's uh, quite a lot of work, and uh, we'd be a bit lost without uh, the help that we do get. Up there, you'll see a computer and that computer is live streaming you and everything you say. So um, just so that you're warned and you know that that's what's gonna happen. Um, and there's usually something I meant to say about you can Twitter and do various other things as well, but uh, it's a little bit beyond me. Okay, so yes, no, I've got it here. Our Twitter handle is at imperial underline IGHI. So if you want to get onto that, you can do that. Um, so we are being recorded, and the um, recording will be available for people outside the college uh, afterwards. I'm very happy uh, that uh, Professor um, uh, Barahona is here. He's the new director. Well, he's the director. It's not quite so new as it was of the EPSRC Centre for Precision uh, in Health Care. No, not, I've got the wrong term, but anyway, close. Um, he's really the new Steve Hawkin, I think. He's um, started off as a physicist, and he's now, it seems, trying to bridge the gap between the quantum uncertainties of individual patients and the cosmology of the, um, of the National Health Service, maybe, and all its black holes. So uh, good luck to that. Um, he's going to co-chair this uh, session, uh, and I'm going to leave him to introduce the session in general, and also our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, well, thank you very much for coming, uh, especially given the current circumstances around college. Um, so it's very good to have uh, such a crowd uh, attending, uh, to attend the talks and the teach-outs that we're having today. Um, um, the, this um, this um, Global Health Forum um, began to emerge uh, in conversations we had um, six months ago or so, and it's part of uh, a collection of initiatives we've been having, um, starting from the Center for Mathematics of Precision Healthcare, which is an EPSRC center that started about a year ago or so, and it is precisely um, a center, which means uh, it's all geared towards uh, enhancing collaboration. When we started with the center, the current craze of AI for or in healthcare was not so apparent uh, because we wrote our proposal perhaps two to three years ago. And now it's, of course, all the craze, but it really fits very much within the ethos of what we were proposing, which was effectively bringing data rich approaches to problems in, health, in healthcare. And that was very broad on purpose. Uh, it went all the way from, you know, characterization with, uh, you know, uh, omics of disease and progression of disease to characterization of populations, um, the interactions between social aspects and uh, disease. And as you will see even, um, you know, uh, more recently, yeah, the black holes of the NHS have begun to appear in the horizon also because uh, when you begin to talk to people who are really involved with some of the operational issues uh, that really are incredibly important, uh, you begin to see that potentially there are some great opportunities in where we can actually interact and perhaps 
contribute. Uh, putting together this uh, forum was actually relatively difficult because there are so many possibilities. And of course, you know, there were only two or three speakers. And what we decided to do is bring somebody who will be the first speaker, Aldo, uh, which in itself posed a, a heavy problem because he just has too many things to, to tell us about. So I forced him to just choose, you know, like a, uh, basically, you know, quantum disentanglement, uh, so that he actually would actually give us just one of his topics. Um, part of what this forum will try to achieve also at the end is to make, uh, make you aware of possibilities that are happening currently on campus or on the different campuses. Uh, Aldo is also leading one of the CDTs in AI for healthcare. Um, which is one of the EPSRC uh, new calls for centers for doctoral training. And uh, he is basically being at the center putting together this collaboration that really from the start has been between math, computing, and some parts of engineering, and the medical school, which uh, I think is where uh, this forum you know, today lies and where we think there is great opportunity. Um, so Aldo, uh, you have only 20 minutes, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> I expect this audience to be mixed, uh, as I've experienced it from previous attendances. And so, I've given, I'm going to give a very light touch technical talk. So, if you expect equations, you will not see any. Uh, and I'm going to give you more, some general feeling about What's going on? Where can we go? And how can we achieve certain things? Uh, things such as projecting my image. Um, let's try that. That should oh. Everything but VGA here. What do you have VGA? Um, let's try that. Fantastic. Good. So, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and about people benefiting from artificial intelligence, but I think the one thing that we really should become aware of is that when we're talking about these interactions between artificial intelligence and the benefits to people, we're really talking about the interactions and benefits to humans. And so let's first realize that humans are a complex machine that processes information, takes it in, uses various beautiful biological mechanisms to transform that into actions. And so this loop of perception and action is constantly going on in humans. And that's what we're trying to imitate when we want to build true intelligent machines. And it's not just about you know, being able to see the ball and know in your head ball. It also is about knowing that there's a ball and then knowing how to act on it, for example, to catch that ball. So it's really about closing the loop. In so my 20 minutes, uh, I want to talk to you about AI and healthcare in this context. And AI and healthcare is really building that we need to put together out of what we mean by AI, what challenges we face in healthcare, and see how we can build a stable house out of that. So I'm going to start with AI. Aspect. And so AI is a very complicated, loaded word for myself, um, because if you think about the trend of the words as they were appearing, we first spoke about big data, then about machine learning, and then now AI is the current craze that sort of summarizes this whole complex thing. And people include robotics into AI, everything is a bit AI, a wearable device is AI. So just to structure that a bit, I think of AI as a question, a 70-year-old question, how can we build machines that in their cognitive and decision-making capacity can imitate that of humans? And a gentleman is looking for a seat to sit down, unless he wants to sit now next to me, maybe one of you can slide in. Thank you very much. So AI is really a question, how can we build such a machine? And so there have been various approaches of the past 70 years, In really, in the past 15 years, machine learning has emerged as the best way to answer that question from the current perspective. It simply says that we cannot engineer from scratch this machine. We can learn using principled approaches from data how to achieve that. So for me, machine learning is the current answer to the hope of ever building an AI. 
And then big data is really the idea that we're collecting massive amounts of data and know how to process that. Well, that is what feeds the machine learning, which answers the question. And so this is matched by the history of AI, basically going from the start of the 50s, where we want to build an intelligent machine to realize we need to learn it, and then realizing we need to have very specific type of algorithms. And now I'm not saying that I'm subscribed to any specific type of algorithms, but effectively everything when we talk about deep learning, uh, machine AI these days, is realized at the moment by deep learning. And so at the moment we're facing what I call the AI iceberg. There's a lot of artificial intelligence that exists below the waterline, actually the vast bulk of it, from recommendation systems for your website to the military, financial technologies, personalization, and other applications that are already deployed and you hardly notice that they exist and that they actually provide AI technology. And then there are obvious manifestations of AI that are above the waterline so that now you can have a conversation with your phone or with your music player or that you have the hope or see or read about cars that can drive themselves. These are visible manifestations of that. And the interesting thing about these two examples is they're visible manifestations because they close the loop. There's something acting, deciding, perceiving, acting, deciding, perceiving. And that's actually a very interesting exploration that I want to take further. I just want to show you and confront you with another aspect of this AI craze at the moment. So probably you've seen this Gartner hype curve that the Gartner group puts out every year. And it basically tracks the progression of technologies through time uh, and being at various levels. So the hype curve is here, that's the peak of the hype. They call it the peak of expected expectations. There's a trough of delusionment where technologies fall and then maybe never recover. And then a few technologies slowly creep up the slope of enlightenment towards what we call the plateau of productivity. So when you're here, your system is actually somehow being used. Now the interesting thing is, and this is a general technological overview, two thirds of the concept that sits somewhere in this hype curve are AI concepts. With a very few exception of smart dust, 5G communication, uh, and commercial drones, Virtually everything else, and nanotube electronics, sorry, virtually everything else sits on what we call the AI space. And so there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of expectation, um, and there's some things that are being sorted out and dying away. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing now is that we see a lot of quick wins being realized because massive amounts of data are available. But as anyone who's ever worked with massive amounts of data, or any amounts of data, you quickly realize that most of the time is really being spent on in getting the data so you can process that. So that's the big disillusionment of any machine learning PhD student of mine, that unless he uses you know, carefully crafted databases, they spend about 80% of the time to you know, being able to load the data, being able to do some internal validation and making sense, and then start doing some pre-processing and collecting the data exhaust before they can actually run their Python script or MATLAB scripts to the actual machine learning. And this is something that's generally misunderstood and misappreciated. Of course, in an ideal world, we would like to be all data to be at this stage here, so we can immediately start deploying our algorithms and seeing them. But we find that even for clinical databases of high quality, uh, we often sometimes at stage B or C. Yeah? And in this ranking of what I call data readiness levels, I don't include the level uh, Z, which is what I call data flirting. When somebody tells you they have this cool data and you speak about it and get all excited, but actually there's not even an Excel file or a data file you can load. And from the last, I understand that you know what I'm talking about. So then I want to briefly mention another point, and that's really that machine learning as engine for modern AI has three pillars. And most of the successes and hype and visibility comes in the area of supervised learning where we're deploying these deep learning algorithms, which is about basically, I show you a, I show you a photo and you told me who it is. Yeah? Uh, that has made a lot of success, especially for methods that will have a lot of data available. But where it becomes more interesting is when we are looking at data and finding structure, data that may be so complex that we don't know how to make sense of it. We just overload it. And here, unsupervised learning is certainly one of the most exciting areas. But really, if I'm talking about closing the loop, I should talk about reinforcement learning. That is, systems that find policies of controlling another system. So here you're closing the loop, the system acts, predicts the actions of its consequences, acts on them, perceives the consequences of action, makes them decisions, adjusts its decisions, 
and continues. And so this is what I call finding a policy, finding a sequence or finding a general idea of what I should do, given that I find myself in different situations, what actions should I take? So I find that personally the holy grail for AI, for understanding how the brain works, and for creating this robo-doctor, as I briefly mentioned. And these days, people cite all sort of surveys that are done. This is one by Weber Shedwick that is a business study. Interesting aspect here. Um, a lot of people perceive that there's more positive than negative impact on AI. Um, that there is actually, and most people perceive that for themselves, the impact is going to be better than for the others. Um, and similarly, uh, there's a lot of uh, positive perception about accelerating AI research or staying at the current rate. And there are differences, and surprisingly, actually, the UK, which had, you know, effectively three major reviews of AI strategies, is one of the countries uh, of, with the lowest ratings of the, uh, what the benefits of AI are. And yet, I find that in the UK, we're almost ideally placed to drive and harness the benefits of AI, specifically in healthcare, because we have the blessing of the NHS as a national organization who can collect data, who can deploy solutions and reach democratically everyone in the country. So let's briefly talk about healthcare. So there are major trends, and I apologize here for the wrong title word appearing, that appear across the field. So on one side, we have nowadays ubiquitous sensors. So if you have an iPhone, you're one of 750 million iPhone users. So that's more than 10% of humanity uses a unified, a reachable, measurable sensor device that can communicate with you. So we are soon reaching a stage where, in theory, we can do N equals all experiments on humanity. Think about the type of clinical trials, studies, and interventions we could execute. Just from a theoretical point of view, t-tests are not the answer, because everything becomes significant at these numbers. The other thing is, of course, the realization that we want to have personalized solutions. That's because we may have genetic differences, we may have life scientists and differences, and we have many various factors that affect us, so we need a personalized treatment. Not alone, because now we're coming to an age where we can diagnose and effectively treat through gene therapy personalized point mutations. So this may be mutations in an amino acid sequence that only you and two other people have on the planet. How can we treat you? How can we help you specifically? And know whether that treatment works that, uh, that doesn't require running vast clinical trials. The other key aspect is that we want to be closed loop. We want to be responsive. So the fact that you can use devices, wearable devices, devices that sit in the cloud that act and interact with you means we can make things responsive. We're not just flooding your body with a single drug. We're not just cutting away a single piece of meat. We can interactively manage something. And so that makes it very interesting for the development of devices. And finally, I think this is a very important trend. We want to be a lot more patient-centric. We want to diagnose, treat you, monitor, help you, where it matters most to you. And for most people, this is at home, not in the hospital where they go for treatment. And so if you look at the areas of where, and this is Accenture, the management consultancy company, looked at areas of application for AI, the biggest benefits they see is in robot-assisted surgery, which is, of course, about closing the loop to assist the surgeons, and we're going to sure hear more about that. But there are many other areas where we're about closed-loop interactions, virtual nursing assistance, um, dosage error reduction by optimizing the dosage, you know, uh, helping support clinical trial, uh, supporting the diagnostics. And so in overall, they estimate that they're in the US alone savings possible by 2016 of $150 billion. And I think another important factor, specifically also in this country, is that while the size of the market for AI and healthcare may grow to something like 6.6 .6 billion, the real issue that we have is uh, the challenge of being able to cope with the demand on our clinicians. And that's because we have aging societies um, putting severe pressure on that. And so they estimate that AI technologies, again, this is for the US, can help reduce 20% um, of the estimated unmet demand by clinicians. And the idea about having AI treating you is actually quite interesting because it's fundamentally democratic. Because copying AI is just copying the bits. It's free. So it's a very progressive way of thinking about how you can democratize healthcare treatment uh, and you know, benefit from the expertise of of, of highly qualified humans and try to port them into machines. 
So there are many application areas for in healthcare, and I won't, don't want to delabor that, but these are the classic things we're talking about. Supporting diagnosis, making diagnosis more objective, faster, and more precise. I'm not going to talk of that. Use AI technologies that sit, say, on your smartphones to identify potential pandemics, you know, flu viruses spreading, killing half of humanity, and supporting directly imaging diagnostics in the area of radiology pathology. These are things that are happening now where people are thinking now about that. But I want to push you a bit further to thinking about what I want to call the robot doc. And just to be clear to the clinicians here, I'm not talking about replacing the clinician. It is about assisting the clinicians with what we call clinical decision support systems. Offload this, the load that they're facing to think about the really complicated cases and reducing the routine use or the routine papers you're facing. Uh, we're still calling this the RoboDoc simply because it's a sexy title, but I think the message is clear. We want a human in the loop. And probably of all areas of AI, Nothing is more personal than AI in healthcare, because ultimately it's about the patient. So there you have a human in the loop, and you may have carers. There's another element of humans in the loop. So we really need to think about a number of factors that are in discussion, in play, uh, if you go to various AI meetings. So one is about trust in AI. How can we manage and build trust that you trust the treatment advice of an artificial system? And we can discuss that in detail. We need to think about how to perform privacy-preserving operations. So how can I get data from your phone about your health without you disclosing anything personally about you, but it will still allow me to detect, say, that there's a flu pandemic coming because half of you have now a flu marker popping up. How can we do that? And I have examples for all of these, but as Mauricio said, I have only 20 minutes and I'm probably almost through my time. We need to talk about interpretability of AI. So this means we need to have systems, models, and this is what Mauricio meant with data-rich modeling or data-rich understanding. Um, we need models that can interpret the data that we have. And that's, I think, a major barrier by the successes of deep learning that we're seeing is there's no interpretation. It just works. We don't really know why. And so the classic modeling, you know, someone sitting down, writing an equation, defining a mathematical model that constrains the problem gives us interpretability. And so it's here specifically that we can think about mathematical, dynamical systems model and probabilistic models that come back into play. This is in direct relationship to another challenge that we're facing, what I call data-efficient AI. We need to be able to learn and reason with little amount of data. So yes, my phone can recognize all the objects in this room because there's access to something like 15 billion annotated images that says this is a car, this is a house, and so forth. But I cannot generate that data from a single patient if I want to help you because that much data will never come out of you in your lifetime. I cannot collect that much data. If I want to treat you or adapt my treatment to you, I need to find ways of using the few bits of information that I can glean of you as efficiently as possible. So yes, deep learning is very sexy and attractive. If you're going to do things that generalize across humanity, across the spread, then you can use these techniques. But you need to think about techniques where you can reduce the amount of data because the algorithms in themselves are not data hungry. And finally, we need to come about thinking about AI that reasons like a human, so we can understand the decisions that it's making. It may not be the optimal way of reasoning, but it's more human-like in its reasoning, and thus maybe more acceptable and more adoptable. So let's come back now to the more technical part of the talk, which is going to be very short, where we're really talking about a system and a human interacting with that system. So this is, again, this idea of the loop. And when you work in reinforcement learning, as I do, then you typically have something we call an agent, the AI, that executes actions that act on the world. And that world responds with that there's a change of the state of the world and that maybe some reward is being issued. And reinforcement learning is basically about learning algorithms that use this loop, explore the world, explore, exploit their decisions they're making uh, to maximize their rewards. And we can think about now bringing in these type of artificial agents a human person into the loop that can, say, judge the quality of a decision that an agent makes. It can tell the agent that it is in a certain state or that this was a good or bad action that it chose. And this has been ongoing specifically in robotic uh, areas of reinforcement learning quite a while. But what I'm interested in is systems where you have a system, an AI, that interacts with the patient. So the system executes an action. The patient's state changes in response to that. And we want to give 
the system a reward or a penalty for the consequences of that action. And so this started a few years ago. A colleague of mine, Gibert Stan, and uh, Daniel Ernst looked at this for in a simulation of HIV treatment. People looked at this in the treatment of dialysis, where the system decides how to act upon that. And then a student of mine, Chris Lowry, and I um, got the first patent for a system that learns from the brain activity of the patient how to optimally dose propofol during surgery in a closed loop system. So while the surgeon patient may slowly wake up, the system detects that, increases the amount of propofol, but it learns something about the physiology of the patient in the course. And that was a data efficient algorithm that in a three to four hour surgery can in theory learn this. And this was all in silico. We just simulated that. Where it became more interesting then is that the following year, um, we did the same study with diabetes, and this is um, experiments we did on rats. So I'm not going to show you the rats, but basically these are systems where we monitored, monitored rats that had diabetes, we monitored their blood glucose level, and we had a system that was an automatic pump, actually an implantable pump, uh, that was delivering insulin to these rats while they were going on about their daily life, eating and doing other stuff. And the system learned a strategy by which was giving uh, sort of in a fractal pattern uh, doses of insulin to keep the level of insulin as low and steady as possible, so of glucose as, as, as normal glycemic as possible. And it learned that, and it learned a very different strategy to how current patients dose themselves. The moment you take a huge bolus of insulin and you map that out, but here the system learned uh, that there should be basically base responsiveness by continuously administering small amounts of insulin and then some large boluses only when there was an overshoot that was significant. And that algorithm not only to keep the distribution of insulin tighter, it also learned to do that with less insulin, which is very important if you want to have an implantable pump connected to a sensor that injects you with insulin. And we took that to another stage where we look now at uh, patients uh, that, had, um, uh, that may have some form of brain disorder. So we hooked up patients to a system uh, where they were in a real-time fMRI scanner. And you know that in many form of brain disorders, your brain is effectively in the wrong state, whatever that means. You know, you're in an overexcited state, you're in a depressed state. So what we wanted here is we had a system that basically monitored the state in real time. We had the ability to deliver stimuli, sound, vision, to that patient. And we basically learned a relationship, the system learned from the interaction of how changes in the stimuli change the brain activity to push the brain activity of the patient into a certain state. So literally, we could basically specify, I want that area of the brain light up, do whatever you need to do to show stimuli to the patient so that happens. And that actually worked. So within a one hour uh, reinforcement learning experiment that we conducted in the scanner, we could indeed target certain brain areas to be activated in certain patterns. And so Romy Lawrence, who was the PhD student at the time, and Ines Violante are now taking this forward to look at interactive treatments where they're delivering electrical stimuli to the brain uh, in this same manner. So what I want to talk to you about, and I probably have just two minutes left, I guess. Five minutes? Yeah, good, five minutes. Is, uh, is, a, is a related project. But here we're taking a different tag. And this is really where I'm talking about the RoboDoc. So here we want to take, not hook up a patient to a machine for now. Here we want to look at what have actual clinicians done to a patient and what were the consequences of these actions. And from these interactions, from these treatment interactions, can we learn as treatment strategy a policy? So we call this off-policy learning because the system is now not acting. It's simply looking over the shoulder of a clinician and learning from him and his interactions. This is a project that I started with Mathieu, who's also somewhere here in the audience, who is both a consultant intensive care specialist and a PhD student, Leo Celi at MIT, Tony Gordon, who runs uh, a lot of the intensive care work at Imperial, and Omar Badawi from, from Philips Healthcare. So here we look specifically at the challenge of treating sepsis. So you may not be familiar with that. So sepsis is the third largest cause of deaths overall in the US, 250,000 per year. It's the main cause of death uh, if you're in an intensive care unit. And it's one of the most expensive medical conditions, 25 billions a year costs. And here, a critical factor is how to dose and time the delivery of intravenous fluids that basically you know, blow, blow up your uh, vascular system and vasopressors, so the things that constrict your blood vessels to, to manage your, blood, uh, your sepsis, which is effectively a blood disease. 
And the interesting thing is that only roughly 50% of patients who are septic are responsive to these fluid treatments. And so sepsis is interesting because it's a very complex, not easily identifiable disease. It's just, it, it happens, it affects you, your whole body's involved. How can we treat that? And so just to, to remind you of this closed loop idea here, we have two knobs how much IV fluid I give you per hour and how much vasopressors I give you per hour. And we can then, and your state is defined by all the readouts that we get from intensive care units. And these databases that are now available are fantastic. So one uh, created at MIT is the MIMIC database. It contains 19,000 adults uh, that have sepsis. It contains all the live feeds of all the time series of you know, blood pressure, heart rate, and so forth, and various blood analyses. And from that, we extracted 242,000 data points. And then we got access to another database made by Philips EI by Philips that has 3.3 million ICU admissions from over 300 ICUs in the US. But actually, we found that there were some challenges with the data quality, not with the quality of the data itself, but with the readiness of the data. Remember what I mentioned earlier about the data readiness, level, data readiness levels. So in the end, we just got 1.4 million data points corresponding to 100,000 patients. So in all, we have run roughly 115,000 to 120,000 patients. Is that a lot of data or is that a little data? So if you now ask uh, ex experienced intensive care specialists, they will have seen by the end of their career roughly 60,000 patients. So at the moment, we have uh, data worth two lifetime experiences of intensive care specialists, but our algorithm is dumb. It knows nothing about human physiology biology, basic laws of reaction. It's not a human looking there, standing over a bed, looking at another human lying in that bed. It has just the data feeds. So how good can we do? So that's an interesting question. And so one of the first things that we did is we take this high dimensional time series, 600 numbers being spewed out multiple times a second, and basically did some very crude dimensionality reduction. We squeezed it down to two dimensions. Um, this says here principal components. It's not as straightforward as you may think. But you basically see a map here. This is the mortality of the patient. So if you're red, it means you're effectively very certain to, go, to die. Zero means you're very unlikely to die in your future. And basically, you find all these different states. The size of the circles tell you how many patients there are. And now we can trace a patient who's delivered into the ICU. So let's pick this gentleman here. Uh, the yellow guy, and he basically threw out his stay in the ICU. He bumps around and moves through the space and then dies. And then there's another person here that starts in a very similar location and you know, bounces around, changes the state. There was something that was done to him or her that helps a lot, moved into this state. And then here, the patient is discharged and goes home. Okay, so we have sort of a map, a visualization of that. So this is where the unsupervised learning comes into space. And basically, we can now track how over time uh, these patients were doing. Now, this could be patients that were just left alone to rot in the room and no one affected them. So here we would see then the time course of their natural progression of the disease. But of course, we know that these patients had treatments done to them. Decisions were made. Drugs were given. IV was given. And so we used a certain type of algorithms that I'm not going to have the time to explain in detail to basically take a patient from one state through sequence of state transitions to the delivery, or if you made the wrong decisions, you take them to death. And so just to illustrate you the power of this algorithm, typically when people talk about decision support, it's about taking a patient from here to here, or say, towards this state here. But what we're really looking for is a policy. And so the policy becomes interesting when I tell you, for example, you cannot walk through this black square. Yeah, you cannot take a patient from here to here. You have to walk around here, or you have to walk around here because there are certain boundaries given by the physiology, by the impact of the treatments. So normally you would, what you want to do is, if you're a typical control engineer, you want to minimize the difference between this state and the target state, and so probably you would do that. But let's assume that from some other data affecting some other patients, we know that actually you cannot do this transition here. It's not possible. Then suddenly, the idea of just minimizing the difference between this and this is a very bad idea because it takes you through the terminal state. So you need to realize in this situation, and this is what I mean, you need to understand the consequences of your actions and the consequences of the actions successive to that, that actually here, you have to go away from the closest path. You have to go up and then to the right. 
Yeah? So effectively, you have to walk backwards from where you want it to be and then look at what type of actions can get me there. And so this is a very specific type of reinforcement learn, learning mathematics that we're applying. And I'm just showing you, again, just in a nutshell, the ideas here. So we've not tested this closed loop in patients. We've just learned it from the data, just so we're clear. And so what did we find? So we found the following thing. Effectively, we can calculate an optimal strategy, what to do if a patient is in a given state. So if all these 600 readouts were looking like that, then this is what you have to do to this patient. And we then simply compare it off in both the amount of IV fluids given per hour and the vasopressors given uh, per, per body weight in minute. Um, we found that whenever the doctors were matching in their decision, the decision that our system made, the survival, the mortality of the patients was lowest. And similarly, whenever the doctor's prescription of vasopressors matched what our system predicted, we could show that, again, we were, we were matched by our optimal policy. And I can show you more visualizations. I'm not going to go into the details of that. But basically, uh, we found that the optimal policy that we can compute was as good as physicians 99% of the time. Now, our system could only see the decisions that clinicians made, but the important thing in contrast to classical algorithms is we just don't look at, you know, this physician made a good decision and we use it. We look at what's the consequence of following that decision and further down the line take that decision. Right? So it's about stringing together across trying, learning the optimal treatment course for a patient and understanding that patients may deviate from that course for other reasons. We calculated an average reduction of mortality around 7% which is actually huge given the numbers. But of course, all of these numbers have to be validated. The one thing that actually strengthens what we're saying is that we trained this on the one data set, this mimic data set, and then ran the prediction of the mortality and the treatment outcomes on the other data set, the large Philips data set. And basically, without having to retune, we could take it from one to the other. So it's an independent data set that we validated it on. And of course, there a bunch of technical aspects and very interesting mathematics to, we need to address to get this further. But the idea is, of course, to close the loop and hook up a patient, just like we did it in the insulin case uh, with, uh, with the rats or in the brain treatment case in the scanner. So let me just come to an end. When we're talking about AI for healthcare, there are various timescales. So right now, you get AI that supports your medical insurance. Uh, and, you know, if they're all free, people are thinking about how to do smarter scheduling better and faster and improve the efficiency and productivity of the healthcare system. So then we're seeing a lot of work in the area of diagnostics, uh, digital um, pathology, for example, and, and boosting drug development. That's in some ways, and I want to be very provocative here, more of the same, just scaled up. But what we really want to go for is what I call these decision support system or robot docs that can, you ha can help you carrying out diagnostics and treatments and bring the patients and the healthcare, the nurses, in when new things happen that you don't know about, when the non-standard things happen. And so to achieve that, we really need to deal with privacy and protection of this healthcare data, and we're thinking a lot about that. But I think what makes this really exciting that we have now a strong interaction between the AI models we're developing and the exploration of the beauty of the complexity of human biology. Thank you. is from the Department of Surgery and has a particular interest in patient safety, which is an extremely uh, expensive um, area if you get it wrong. So of great interest to all of us, particularly those of us who are getting a bit older.
Good. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk uh, this afternoon. Um, I wear three hats, really. I, I'm a consultant surgeon at uh, St Mary's in the Royal Marsden. Uh, I am a clinical uh, senior lecturer in the Department of Surgery and Cancer and Centre for Health Policy, sitting within the Patient Safety Centre. Uh, and also, I've just recently been appointed as the uh, Chief Clinical Information Officer for Analytics Informatics at Imperial Healthcare Trust. So I wear many hats, but actually beautifully all aligned to get us to where I'm going to talk to uh, today. Uh, so as we've just heard, patient safety uh, is a huge burden uh, in, in the NHS. And these are some of the, some of the highlights uh, around how many admissions to hospital have some form of uh, adverse event per year. That's about 850,000 uh, within the England and Welsh uh, NHS. They cost us about £2 billion uh, pounds, uh, per year. And of course, some of those are settled as negligence, and that costs us about £400 million. Something that's very top of course is around hospital acquired uh, infections, which has a staggering cost of about one billion and is causing increasing uh, a burden because of the uh, rise of antimicrobial uh, resistance. And significantly, about 400 people per year die as a direct result of adverse events relating to uh, medical devices. So, and all I'm going to talk about today was around data for patient safety, uh, and that sits very much within the context of the NIHR Imperial Patient Safety Translation Research Centre, uh, which we have thankfully just renewed for the third uh, five-year uh, period. This is directed by, by Aradazi. We spent most of the first 10 years really actually documenting the burden of harm. It might sound, that might sound quite surprising to you, but we didn't really have a hand on what the burden of harm was out there because people weren't recording it. We needed the data to actually understand what was, what was going on. The shift of focus now in the next five years uh, is more around taking that learning and thinking about how we can turn it into direct patient benefit, come out with practical and actionable solutions that are sustainable, uh, and part of that is obviously thinking about the data we have and gaining value from it. We have six themes of work, uh, one of thinking very much about the transitions of care. Uh, we very much in the past thought about healthcare as siloed, primary care, secondary care, community care, social care, of course, people move through all those sectors along their pathway, we need to join it all up. We have a theme very much about how we can Patients themselves are the directors of their own care and they can actually improve the safety of the care if the system allows them to. We've got to think about the huge burden of the deterioration of patients and how we detect it earlier, to think about how we rescue their care, and of course that is obviously important for the patient, but also cost effective. Medication safety recently in the press about the burden of medication error and poor prescribing and, the, and what harm that causes to patients, and Brian Dean Franklin, uh, who's a national expert on that, is leading that theme. We just heard about diagnostic support, and my colleague Brenda Delaney, who's a GP, has got a long-standing interest in that, particularly around detecting cancer earlier. And also we have a whole theme dedicated around cost-effectiveness. And these are just some of the highlights of the data-related work that we're doing uh, through this centre uh, over the next uh, three to four uh, years. And I'm going to pick up on a few of these uh, today uh, in, in my talk. Obviously, I won't have the chance to go through all of them. So we've just heard about big data, uh, and uh, big data is a term that's been thrown around uh, a lot recently. There's lots of definitions around it. Um, I suppose one thing we've done well in healthcare is started to collect lots of volume of data. We're inundated with volume of data. But coming back to the point I made earlier, it's about taking that data and turning it into value, into insights that we can then change actions of people uh, uh, around. We have huge volumes. The big problem we have is around the variety of data. And thinking about sort of the human factors science, one thing we've done very well in healthcare, particularly in the last five years, is encouraged people from a bottom-up approach to innovate and introduce new technologies, new data, new systems, new digital applications. That's creating more and more data. But of course, there was no standardisation around how that introduction happens. We've now got multiple systems flying around with different APIs, not an open API system, different ways of messaging, so we can't actually connect them all together. 
So part of my new role is actually from a top-down approach, from an infrastructure perspective, of how we can start to bring these systems together to make sure we know everything about the patient, all that information is collected in different ways. The other challenge we have, of course, is that most of the data we actually collect in healthcare is, comes from humans themselves. So we're now introducing the concept that we have to deal with the human behaviour. Obviously, things like blood pressure, pulse, temperature, they're very standardised. But actually, a lot of the data we collect is free text. It's people's comments on a, on a person's state, their views on their health, entering the symptoms they presented with in A&E. Patients themselves presenting their experience, their satisfaction. And of course, we then have to think about how we handle that data as well. And so that's what this slide really sums up. We have lots of structured data within the system, administrative data. Patient was admitted to A&E, went under this consultant, stayed this length of time, had this operation with this diagnosis. That in itself seems easy, but actually I'll show you in a moment it's quite a challenge to deal with that. We have some unstructured data, so data that doesn't sit within a relational data set, but we can start to structure. And then more the free text, the, the unstructured data that sits within the system. And we've got to try and bring all these uh, elements together. So how are we going about it? Well, there's really four strands to the work that we're doing, and I'm going to touch on these uh, in more depth uh, now. We're actually saying, well, let's not just throw away the data we've got. Can we actually take the data we have and use it in a more intelligent way? And we've done lots of work uh, in the sector around this, thinking about patient segmentation. The idea, we're moving away from the traditional approach of saying, I believe this patient's at risk because of X, 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 and X, and just let, let the data itself drive out the segments of the population at risk, or drive out the segments of the population and predict how they're more likely to use the various healthcare services that are available to them. Because if we know that, we can then change the healthcare system to cater for all those different needs. A patient group is not homogenous. They all have very heterogeneous needs and expectations. So we need to be able to deal with that so that we become a resilient system. Part of the problem we have in healthcare is that we're reacting the whole time. We're not predicting. And you think about winter bed pressures. Every year they say, my God, the winter's happened. We've got lots of admissions. Same thing every year. We know, we should know what is coming, where people are going to present based on their comorbidities, the elderly population. How is their healthcare structure structured so we can then deal with it? How do you change it to deal with it? So we need to be a bit more predictive. We're doing a lot around advanced analytics. A lot of the work's been done with Mauricio, and he's going to talk about some of that uh, in a moment, and I'll touch on specific examples. Something that Aldo touched on as well is about this idea of a learning health system. It's all very well having this data and using it, but we've got to be able to gain insight from it and then see how people's actions change as a result of the intelligence we're giving them back. We've got to be able to capture that and then feed that back into the data again, that learning health system, a bit like a PDSA cycle. And that's something that's really important because, again, going back to the points that Aldo made, it's fine giving people data. If it's in a black box, they may not trust it. So we've got to think about the ways of how we use behavioural science to nudge them, both in terms of trust but then changing their behaviour. And that's an evolution as opposed to a step change. And finally, we can't obviously not talk about M Health. We hear the word M Health and apps the whole time. But actually, this is a really, really important part of what we do. Because apps or mobile digital platforms are a hugely important portal for both collecting data in novel ways. But coming back to the point I just made, they also provide the portal by which we can then alert frontline healthcare professionals to a deteriorating patient. The trick for us is then capturing how their behaviour changes as a result of those alerts, and we're going to talk about those now. So one of our flag stream projects is now called Streams. It used to be called HARC. Uh, I see some members here from the Helix Centre, which is our collaboration between Imperial College and Royal College of Art, a centre which brings together designers, clinicians, engineers uh, to do iterative design process, patient and person-centric design. Uh, this has now been acquired by a collaboration with uh, Google DeepMind, and it is a task management system. A lot of what we do in healthcare as junior doctors relies on the good old bleep system and the landline telephone to say, can you come and prescribe that? Can you come and prescribe this? So what this does is start to automate that messaging process. Uh, but it also, in the background, has machine learning technology that starts to recognise signs based on the information that's being put into it to alert you to a deteriorating patient. 
So they start to prioritise the task of junior doctors of which one they should do first, rather than just starting at the top and always replacing the top task with one that most, came, most recently came onto their list. So that's an important piece of work that we are uh, just trialling within St Mary's uh, at the moment to demonstrate the impact. Some of the information we know about um, patient safety um, comes from people reporting incidents. Okay? Because we rely on people to report so we actually have an understanding of the landscape that's out there. But from estimates, we only think that about 5% of the incidents that happen in healthcare actually get reported. So we're missing out on a huge volume. The way that systems are reported is uh, people submit uh, an incident report. The most common system is Datex, uh, used by about 65% of trusts across the, across the country. That information then gets uploaded into a national repository, the National Reporting and Learning System. That was set up by Liam Donaldson at the National Patient Safety Agency uh, about uh, 13 years ago now. The idea was that people could report anything. We wanted voluntary reporting. We, we set the net wide but shallow to try and get insights of what was going out on uh, within, within the country. Now we have about one to one and a half million incidents reported per year. But again, that's only about 5%, we think, of what actually happens within, within hospital. The problem with the system is that it's become a means to an end. People just report and they don't get any feedback about what they're reporting on in terms of one particular incident, or indeed the learning across all those reports that happened across the country. And so we asked to do a piece of work where we actually reviewed the purpose of this reporting system and where we could improve it going forward, because the important thing is about the feedback and learning to change people's behaviours, to then improve the safety of care, to feed that back into the data that's collected. So two main areas where we, we, we looked into was actually the reporting process itself. It's found that generally it takes far too long. People become disenfranchised. They therefore don't report. We miss the opportunity. So we've got a new um, digital uh, platform called Care Report, uh, which we're just about to trial again in St Mary's, which has stratified the reporting process. It's cut down all the data entry points uh, that you need to enter. Most importantly, it provides some personalised feedback to the person reporting, a bit like when you order your product on Amazon, you know when it's been dispatched, where it's got to, when it's about to be delivered. It gives you some interaction, as opposed to the old system where you press send and you just never know what happens, happens to it. But the reporting is not the means to the end, as I said. Really importantly, behind this, we're now thinking about uh, the analytics that can then, for the, for the organisation, give them a better oversight as to what's going on within the organisation. You may find it unbelievable, but actually that comes down to a lot of manual pattern recognition. They get these reports in, they start to try and identify, oh, there's one of those instances over there, another one on that ward, another one on that ward. There's no collation of this, and of course this is an invaluable opportunity for advanced analytics to provide better oversight for quality improvement. Through the work we did with the old National Reporting Learning System, we found some striking uh, areas, though, where we, we need to improve on. The form that people submit comes into two parts. There's a structured part where people are asked to put in their name, date of birth, where the incident happened, the ward, and they're asked to categorise the sort of harm that happened and the type of incident that happened. Because the complexity is around the taxonomy, most people don't enter that data or tick other. And that doesn't change even if your level of harm goes up. People find it too, too difficult to navigate their way through. Or more importantly, the taxonomy that we're asking them to classify into isn't really clinically intuitive. It doesn't fit with what, what their medical understanding, what actually happened to the patient or member of staff or carer on the ward or in outpatients. The other really interesting thing we found is that there's a free text entry as well. And actually, the richness of the information is in that free text, not within the structured data. But that free text isn't handled or analysed at the moment. There are reasons for that. Um, and it comes back to the point I made about most of the information we have is entered by humans. Okay? And this is one example. This isn't just spelling mistakes. This is different abbreviations as well. So Clostridium difficile, 
is a well-known infection. It's a mandated reported infection within organisations. And when we looked, it's spelled or abbreviated in 371 different ways. That's a real challenge if you're just trying to extract all the cases of C. diff. I've done it already. I've abbreviated it within the NHS or within your organisation. And this really has led us on to where our focus of work is at the moment within the trust, which is trying to tackle this problem of all the free text that's there, be it within the electronic patient record, be it within patient experience data, be it within the incident reporting system, how we can start to process it in a more automated way. One of the other important facets of big data is presenting the information back to the people in real time. We don't do that at the moment. But also importantly, how we then start to link that unstructured data to the other elements of the patient record because a lot of them are anonymized or the identifier we use you can't cross reference with the electronic patient record that's where we've got to at the moment uh, we can enhance the way we analyze the free text we can do word association uh, semantic correlation this is some piece of work that joshua simons who heads up our big data analytical unit has done just a sort of introduction into this and you can see how by rather than looking for kidney failure as a key term within the reports, you start to combine IV fluids and renal function, you can actually start to pick up other cases of kidney failure that you otherwise would miss with more traditional ways of word searches or word clouds. Of course, there's the opportunity around unsupervised machine learning. And I'm not going to steal Mauricio's thunder, who's going to talk to you about this in a moment, a piece of work we've been doing around this. Most importantly, what this allows us to do is use that data-driven approach to drive out potential categories that we want to report as opposed to being forced to try and report into the taxonomy that's there within uh, the system. Moving on to patient experience, you may not instantly think, oh, that's safety, but of course within the domain of quality, we have effectiveness, experience and safety, and actually they all overlap. There's also another reason why we use patient experience as our area to focus on uh, for, for our further analysis or further advancement of trying to tackle the free text data. And that's because there's something a bit unethical that's happening in the NHS. So within, this is across all organisations, but within Imperial, we collect about 16,000 free text responses to the friends and family test every month. So you multiply that up across the whole country, that's huge volumes. We don't use it for quality improvement. I don't believe that's ethical. We're asking people to feedback and we don't use it. I say we don't use it, we use it to a degree. Stephanie Harrison-White is our head of patient experience. She sits there with a cup of coffee once a month and tries to read them manually. She's not going to get through 16,000. So this is why we put this area of work to take this forward. And Mustafa Kunbai, who's our PhD student with us, um, is, is doing this uh, piece of work. Uh, just for purposes of time, I'll, I'll get through it uh, quite quickly. This is the sort of form that you people typically fill in for the friends and family test. The top of it is all about the free text entries. Two questions, what did we do well? What could we do better? People write down uh, what they, what they, um, what they uh, believe. So we took a period over about six months uh, and did an extract of all those free texts, uh, which gave us nearly 120,000 responses, 65,000 what you did well, 65,000 what could you do better. And Mustafa, to his credit, sat down and coded 6,000 of them manually. He's undertaking a piece of supervised machine learning. So the idea that you take a training data set, the coded one, and you try and train a system uh, to do it autonomously. In order to do that, we need to assign, he needs to assign the contents of that free text to certain domains around patient experience. And we've used the NHS patient experience framework, which picks up on some big themes around respect, coordination, comfort, emotional support, uh, transition and continuity and access uh, to care. We also added domains around staff and general. And of course, there's some that are unclassified. You just can't assign them to a domain. So this is some of the early work. It's only uh, three, four months in, it's done a huge amount. And what this slide shows you um, is that people generally report into one domain only. So what we, how we set the system up, we said, well, we could allow them to report into two domains. Uh, on the left, we've got inpatient. And you can see that most of the blocks there, uh, sorry, you can see on, sorry, on the, on the left-hand side, I've got my pointer. On the left-hand side here, you can see that most people only report into one domain. 
as opposed to reporting into two domain. The two domain bar charts are very, very small. The other thing you can start to see is that across different areas, be it maternity, outpatients, or inpatients as displayed here, people are reporting different areas. Okay, so it can start to discriminate just by doing this, this sort of manual domain uh, assignment. So when we run some bigrams on this, on this data, this is the 6,000, you start to pick out some of the words that people are, are reporting uh, against. Uh, so typical things that are coming out in inpatients is friends, friendly staff, waiting time seems to be a common theme, both, both across what are we doing well, what could we uh, do better. But the system can start to actually give you a bit of insight. Of course, what we want to do is automate this, and this is the position we're in, we're in now, uh, and uh, through, uh, you can use different learners uh, to, to do, this, do this autonomously. Of course, you need to understand uh, what the accuracy of, of those are. So in the end, you end up using an SVM uh, a learner around this. And we've got an accuracy uh, of about 70%. So that is 70% of the time the system autonomously gives you the same domain as he coded manually. You may say, well, hang on, surely you want 100%. Well, maybe not. Because, of course, if we ask Mustafa's to go back and code again in six months' time, he may slightly assign it to a different domain, because it is slightly subjective. So we can't expect the system to lose that subjectivity as well, and that's what he's doing uh, at the moment. You may also say, well, is it just him? We've actually got four different coders uh, doing the coding, and the interrelator reliability uh, is, is very good. The other thing that's come out of this as well, though, is that you would believe from a semantic uh, point of view, that what are we doing well, you would always get positive semantics. And that's not the case. Actually, when we look at it, people are reporting negative things in that what are we doing well, as well as in what could we, what could we do better. And that's really important. And that's a very practical thing. Because of course, you may say, well, let's just look at the whole what are we doing well to get positive things out for quality improvement and what we could do better. So you need to actually look at both to actually draw out the semantics around it. So we're about to, the server is in the trust, we're about to press go and doing this in real time. So Stephanie and her team will now get the patient experience domains in real time every day. So they can, we then are going to start a quality improvement piece of work with our quality improvement team to obviously look at how we can improve the care on the wards in real time. So just in the last couple of minutes, um, I've spoken about how we're starting to bring together uh, different data sets uh, within the trust. I made the comment earlier that we've got structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. The challenge actually is even just getting the structured data together. So at Imperial we have our electronic patient record, which is Cerner based. Within Cerner there are about a thousand lookup tables sitting in the background. Just to give you an idea, when we enter stuff in the front end, we need to map them to where that data goes in the back end. We've done a piece of work uh, over the last four weeks just to work out when I enter a problem or a diagnosis in the patient's record, it's taken us four weeks to work out where it goes in the back end. There is no data dictionary. No one has ever collected metadata around this. Often what happens in the NHS is contractors come in, they do pieces of work, they take their knowledge with them, they move on. So what we're doing at the moment is very much when we're joining this data together, we're collecting a big met metadata catalogue so that we can share this, so other trusts don't have to go through the same process. That's just not fair. Lastly, I've spoken about secondary care, but you remember right at the very beginning, I said, of course, patients don't, aren't born in hospital, live in hospital all their life, and die in hospital. They transition out into the other sectors of care. And this idea of the transitions is really, really important. And we have the opportunity now in northwest London where we have an integrated data set of the 2.4 million population where we are linking together the primary community, social and secondary care and we're bringing that into our data warehouse because then really importantly we can start to look at the transitions. And to give you two very, very quick examples, this is why it's important. This is a piece of work we've done with a national data set from primary care, CPRD, uh, which is linked to HES, the inpatient secondary care data. This has got coverage of about 11% of the population when we did this analysis. This was looking at a very common problem, a patient safety uh, indicator, venothrombolic embolism, DVT. When we used HES alone, we missed out 
about 40% of DVTs that are happening to our patients. Because, of course, we discharge them. We finish the coding of their episode. They go into primary care, have their DVT. We never know about it. So I didn't know. I had a problem with my patients having a DVT after their operation. So this demonstrates the, base, the benefit of using data sets that transition that care by linking the primary and secondary care data. Sorry, the primary and secondary We can actually understand what's going on along the, along the transition and, of course, improve the quality of what we do in secondary care before we discharge them. This is another piece of work going back to the incident reporting system that Isabella singalani has been doing. He's a postdoc with us and got links in the, with Mauricio in the Math Centre. One thing about the incident reporting system is that you don't only have to be in a hospital to report into it. You can be in primary care. Now, actually, primary care aren't very good at reporting into it. It's only about 1% or 2% overall. But what it's telling us, interestingly, is that the primary care doctors across the country are reporting more about problems that happen in secondary care that we don't know about. It doesn't go into the same system, and we don't know about it. A big, big problem is medication error. We, all our doctors and nurses, are prescribing and discharging with errors in that prescription that are only being picked up, if they are picked up, in the community. Some aren't. And of course, that's when people get readmitted uh, with severe harm. So this is a really important piece of work. On my last slide, we've got lots of challenges ahead of us. Uh, I've spoken about access to data. Of course, access to data does require consent from patients. Not if it's completely de-identified. Those are sort of records we can share amongst the college or for research. That is completely de-identified. The problem is, if it's de-identified, you have broken the chain in terms of giving it back to the hospital to then push it into the electronic patient record. Okay? So what we're looking at and what we're working through is the legal basis by which we can keep some form of that chain there so that we can re-identify it, put it back into the electronic patient record. So we can use the advanced analytics that we don't have in the trust that we can use across the college to harness that to make a real uh, change for our patients. We've mentioned the interoperability. Aldo's already mentioned, is the system ready? We're going to flood the system with data. And we as doctors and nurses and physios have to change the way we work. And that's going to be a real sea change, uh, which is coming. We can't forget the patient. It's something I'm very passionate about. They can provide us with the most insight about their care, but we've got to be able to engage them and empower them to be able to partner in that care so we can learn from them and allow them to influence their care, uh, which often provides the best quality. Thank you very much. Otherwise, we'll go on. Um, so the next bit, we we'll come back to the beginning, and uh, I think go on to learning about free text and how you deal with that. Which is very Um, okay, um, so we are behind schedule, but I think there is uh, some leeway there. I will try not to extend too much. Um, so actually what I wanted to tell you about is much more concrete, um, but it has been very well set up by the previous two talks. Um, effectively, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, tell you about a piece of work we've been uh, doing in collaboration, as you will see, with Eric, Sophia, and one of my students. And uh, it really sits in that uh, sort of middle box that Aldo mentioned as being interesting. I also find it interesting, which is basically unsupervised uh, learning um, and understanding complex data. So what I will try to basically convey um, in these uh, 15 minutes or so is with pictures, and no equations either, um, how through some kind of lateral thinking, we applied some work that we have been doing in a different part of uh, basically data analytics and math into a new area. And in fact, I will start with that other part that is close to say, the interest of perhaps some people in the audience, because actually it came from uh, omics analysis in uh, basically basic medical science. 
Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the talk. Uh, as I said, the collaborators specifically for this project are Tarek. I don't know if he's around, but he's the one who has done uh, basically a lot of the work. Sophia, who's also there, and Eric, who already mentioned in passing some of the work. And it's based upon the work of several of my PhD students who have already you know, like graduated and CG who is still around. And there's been some uh, support also from the BDAU, which is the Big Data Analysis Unit in St. Mary's, who actually curate and uh, you know, give, you know, has uh, access to the data, and Josh Simon specifically. Okay, so as I said, I will give you in three steps uh, what the talk is gonna be about. Um, basically, the talk is about high dimensional data. And that basically means that you have a series of samples that have many features, potentially too many features. So it's all good to have you know, data that is very rich, but if you have lots of features, you know that there is a lot of information, but potentially confounding information, redundant information. How do you throw away information? That really is what dimensionality reduction is trying to achieve. So dimensionality reduction is really saying, although I have a thousand things describing you know, this particular sample, in reality, if I'm smart, I could just select a few potentially not just a few of the, of the observables, but has a combination of those that will allow me to describe well what is happening. However, as you will see later, that's not a trivial uh, issue at all. The third part, which will be an element of what I will tell you, is that you, know, you will see that we go always to descriptions of the data in terms of graphs. And I will try to justify what is, that is the case. And it's based on the fact that you know, graphs are very particular objects that summarize information very concisely. So they depart, in a sense, from an understanding of data that is purely statistical. And that has its pros and its cons, but when you are dealing with high, uh, when you are dealing with high dimensional data, it allows you, in a sense, to abstract information much more drast drastically. Okay, so the point of connection with the publication is that, as I will try to show you briefly, text is, in fact, high dimensional data. Okay? So we will not start talking about text, but I will try to motivate that actually a good description of text is that it's very high dimensional data. And recently, there has been a big advance on how to represent this directly in the same framework as you know, high dimensional data in general. And the application, already Eric mentioned, has been dealing with incident records in hospitals and trying to use free text as basically a case study. Right, so let me start with, uh, as promised, an example that has nothing to do with text, but actually, in essence, really has the same structure. And that's something that perhaps many of you in the audience, not the computer scientists and the mathematicians, but perhaps the medics, will actually know, which is perhaps you have a series of experiments where you have collected you know, some description. In this case, it's not terribly high dimensional, but you are, li you are maybe measuring the you know, transcriptomics or the expression levels of some genes in a series of samples, in this case, cells, okay? And you end up with a matrix like that one. And what happens there is basically you have, you know, each sample, is in this case is a cell, is described by a relatively high dimensional vector. In this case, it's not so dimensional, high dimensional, it's only 50 dimensional, okay? If you do omics, you're gonna get a 25,000 dimensional vector. Now, uh, what do you do with this kind of data? You do usually some kind of statistical analysis, and that what really entails is, in one way or another, is to actually create a similarity or a correlation between the samples based on your observations. So you produce a matrix like this one, and it tells you, hey, of all those samples, you know, there are some of them that are very similar, right? And you, know, you can sort of like group them. And you, know, you have another button in your setup that actually allows you to do PCA which actually you know, was mentioned before. And what that does is sort of like says, yeah, if you really want to understand what's happening, you know, maybe with only two dimensions you can do it. And this is PC1, PC2. And it's a combination of all the coordinates you have. And uh, basically, you like to separate your samples. Okay? So now, this is uh, very well understood. It's an incredibly powerful technique. And it has, actually, it's beautifully mathematically, because it has a perfectly well-described uh, um, set of results that tells you that this is optimal in a particular sense. I will try to tell you in pictures when it is optimal and why, for many interesting problems, this doesn't work. 
Okay, so we're going back to our system. Now I, I, I show you a similar kind of cartoon as before, but now this is more omics. You have a lot more genes right, than before. We still have some samples, and you, are, you have measured this representation of each of the cells in terms of these uh, you know, genes in this case, but they are features, basically. Okay? And it's important to keep it general. You have samples described by features, many of them, high-dimensional data. Okay? So what uh, we do is, you know, and what this under, underpinning this uh, transformation we saw before of PCA and, you know, this correlation is I take each of these samples, which is a column of that matrix. That's my vector. That describes my sample. Okay? And now I think of it as living in this very high-dimensional space. It's a vector, like the arrows you, you saw, you know, in high school. And it lives, it's simply that it's really, really high-dimensional. And, of course, you can do the same for all of the samples you have there. So you get, you know, a representation of all of those living in that space. And then what PCA does is actually tries to find one plane. If you want two coordinates, it will give you precisely a plane. If you want n coordinates, it will give you a hyperplane. Okay? And it tries to find the best plane on which to project all this data in a way that minimizes distances. Okay? That's what it tries to do. And that's what you get. So when you do PC1, PC2, you get this projection. You put all those guys projected on the plane, and that's what you get. Okay? So as I said before, this is well defined. It minimizes basically Euclidean distance with respect to the plane, and that's what you get. Uh, as a reminder. Now, what happens when you have data like this? And well, this is the simplest you can think. So this is a three-dimensional, this is a classic example. It's called the Swiss roll, for obvious reasons. And uh, you know, you have this thing lives in three dimensions, right? And uh, you say, well, but this is not really three-dimensional, right? It's just, it's just, you know, it's twisted, but it's two-dimensional. Now, you ask PCA to do this, right? And PCA is going to have a hard time, obviously, right? Because there is no good plane. So you can, you know, chop your Swiss roll however you want. You're going to find that certain, you know, things that are supposed to be not very close in the Swiss roll are going to be projected together. Okay? So the guys, you know, that you know, supposedly are at the center, you know, that supposedly are very far away from those guys at the very end. In fact, when you find a plane like this, they are on top of each other. Right? There is no good plane where to project things. In the previous data before, that was also happening because, in fact, that was an analogy that I was trying to use to explain something that was biological. And it was that, suppose that this data actually comes from, you know, developmental uh, cell biology. And you have these sort of cells that are supposedly evolving from stem cells and they are differentiated. So the cartoon from Waddington from 1957 is that one there. But of course, you know, you are ignoring all of this. And if you do your PCA, what you're trying to do is not considered that potentially this is sort of like living in this high dimensional sort of like tree. And uh, you've tried to find your planes. And that plane is bad. And the other one was bad also. There is no plane. And then you try to project and you get everything on top of each other. And uh, that's not what you want, really. What you want is something like that. Okay? So what you want is a representation that, in a sense, allows you to extract these lower dimensional manifold, in this case, it's sort of like a tree-like manifold, um, directly from the data without me imposing it. Okay? For that, we use graphs. Okay? And a particular procedure that we have been developing for a while. And just in case of curiosity, this is what you get with the same data set that before was a mess when you actually project it using these kind of methods. So you get a projection where you have stem cells at the apex, and you have branches corresponding to different differentiation branches in order without imposing it, just because the data was well selected. Right. Long the tour to actually come finally to the point of how is this related to text. And I promised there was a relationship. I would like to motivate it. Uh, so the scheme is exactly the same as before. We're going to go through this projection. We're going to try to get a graph. And we're going to be using the graph then, which is a better defined object, capturing what the data is, to do some kind of clustering. Okay? Um, and we use graphs, as I said before, because it's a concise way of representing loads of information. Uh, it can, it's very flexible. And it can represent many different kinds of relationships. And it has a lot of very nice, interesting results that are combinatorial, and that opens up loads of possibilities. Right. So once you have a graph, 
just to give you an example of something that will be very different, is that you can ask yourself, okay, if I want to find, now my graph is going to correspond to, you know, you have every node on my graph will be actually, in the original case, was a cell. In what we'll show you later, it's going to be exactly a, a document. Okay? So um, this graph will actually be telling me, you know, certain things are similar to each other, as we described initially. And I want to find groups of things that are relatively similar to each other and different to others. So then you can use graph partitioning algorithms, and what they do is, in essence, something like this. Suppose that you have a graph that has, you know, some, you know, triangles that are of things that are very similar to each other, and they are not so similar to the other triangles, and then there is another big triangle, and it's not so similar to the other one. So you have this structure. If you think of how, you know, a, a, you know, a, a blot of ink would diffuse in that graph, it will pick it up. It will first diffuse into the small triangles, get caught, then diffuse into the bigger triangle, get caught. And if you look at that, you will realize, actually, hey, there are small triangles and a bigger triangle. Okay? That's the essence of graph clustering in many, in many methods. And then you can do things like this, analyze, you know, all sorts of graphs, you know, citation networks, the power grid of Europe, and you can spend some time looking at, you know, wars in the 19th century, and uh, current uh, political crisis in uh, southern Europe. Um, you can actually apply it to uh, image segmentation, because after all, an image is a graph. And as you actually scan through the different you know, scales of your graph, you will find that there are different ways of partitioning that actually pick up the different scales that are present in a painting, for example. Like in this case, you have the big painting and the small paintings that are on the background there. Um, okay, so this is basically the tool we have to actually find, in an unsupervised way, good partitions of a graph. Okay, so now this can be applied to text, and this is where the data set came in. So we used this. This is basically a pilot project we've been running um, with uh, Eric and uh, Tarek doing the work. So it belongs to this huge data set of patient safety data, but we've taken, of course, a very small part of it. This is basically just you know, three months of data. This is like 13 million, so we've done a trial test on a few thousands of records. Okay? And the idea is basically that you, know, you have these records, you are given you know, a classification, and you have free text at the bottom of the, of the record. And as Eric was saying, there is question marks about how well this classification represents the content of the records. Are there better ways of actually extracting information by just looking at the free text without using the classifications? So we are going to ignore them, and only a posteriori we'll check if we are actually getting something out of the data. Okay? So it's unsupervised. We are not training. And as promised, you know, this is, has been a big uh, sort of like a step change in the last four or five years which is how do you represent text in terms of basically high dimensions. Google came up with a very cryptic uh, paper with no exp explanation almost, except that it worked. Um, and of course it's Google, right? And everybody says it must be good. And actually it is quite good, I have to say. Um, and it's basically it's called word to vec and doc to vec And what it does is basically is it takes text, a whole corpus of text, and at the end of this process, which is done with a deep learning algorithm, it actually gives you that each word is described by a high dimensional vector. Let's say 300 dimension. You can choose the dimension, but let's say that's a good number. Okay? So now you get this description of a high dimensional vector for each word. And it has very nice properties, like the ones that actually Tariq picked there. Which is that, you know, um, as you see there, king and queen are related, man and woman are related. If you add and subtract their corresponding vectors, you can go directly from king to queen by subtracting man and adding woman. Okay? So it basically captures content and it captures, captures syntax. So walked and walking are equally related as swim or swam and swimming. Okay? And that's because in the usage of text, the words are organized in particular ways that actually allow us to find this from the structure. Right, so now we have our pipeline and the pipeline is gonna be Text, transform into these high dimensional vectors, transform into graphs, partition in an unsupervised manner into groups. So we'll have eventually a graph of documents that we're going to partition completely in a supervised manner. Okay? 
That's basically the pipeline. So you have transformed a corpus of documents into a graph. And in an unsupervised manner, we find are there good ways or good groups of documents that relate to each other. And uh, you run these algorithms and you get this set of partitions and you can choose because effectively you're not looking for one way of partitioning your data set. You have different levels of resolution of your data. Okay, this is completely unsupervised. We don't know anything about categories. Just looked at the free text at the bottom where people who they really don't want to bother with, with choosing the right category, they write what, they really, what really happened. Okay? So we, I just chose two or three of the categories that, uh, that you find, or sorry, of the groupings that you find. And what you have is basically this sort of structure that goes from very fine categories to bigger groupings. Let's not call them categories because they are not. They are topics, if you want, coming from the free text. As you can see, without imposing, it has a very nice quasi-hierarchical structure. This comes directly from the data. Okay? And then you can focus on certain levels and see what is in those groups of documents. And, uh, well, the first thing we did is compare, you know, now a posteriori, with the categories we were given. And the first nice thing that happens is that, you know, actually the categories are relatively consistent in some cases with, sorry, I should say the topics, with the categories that were external. As you can see, this matrix here is actually very uneven. That means, you know, they are well localized, which is a good thing. On the other hand, there are certain categories, official categories, that are never really well, you know, connected with content. Um, and we did some looking into this. We are beginning now with a more detailed analysis of this. So, for example, you know, you have certain categories that will never be declared, but they are very, very important. Things like, you know, CT scans, obstetrics, they are, there is no category for that, but they truly are very, very separate. And there is a whole set of incidents that are always related to those things that can be picked directly from the content. Okay. Um, so you can basically create representations, like the ones that, you know, uh, Eric was um, showing before. And this can allow you to monitor records in a basically a supervised manner and call attention to certain levels of content of uh, reports that are being uh, produced. Um, I think in the last one, you know, we actually compare it with, you know, you have almost comparable types of numbers of categories. And actually they are, you know, just, you, know, you can see here that actually the topics, if you want, are very well defined. Some of them are truly related to things you expect, you know, like uh, falls and people falling from beds and stuff like this. A lot of the others are, you know, infrastructure are mostly about, uh, it looks like nursing uh, staff, staffing problems. So there are lots of that. And there are these sort of like uh, things that, you know, are constantly there. For example, you see there the uh, group three is the, obstet the obstetrics. It's always there. It never disappears, right? There is another one about radiotherapy, you know, which is constantly present there as an intrinsic category in or topic in the, in the reports. That's all that I want to tell you. And, uh, autistic people have to keep entering the same the same information over and over again um, and it I understand about the data safety and that sort of stuff but there must be a way of you training some sort of Robocop program thing where it can identify places that we've been advice we've been given treatment programs because a lot of autistic people across the spectrum have got very complex needs you have some autistic who's also epileptic who also has um, other sleep problems, 
other physical problems with musculoskeletal and stuff like that. Every single time you go to see different people, you have got to fill in different paperwork. If there's a medical passport digitalized and updated, and we gave permission at every point of entry, so primary care, secondary care, wherever in hospitals, wherever there's been problems, then it might minimize the kind of crossover of clinician care, etc. But also, I want some recognition. You mentioned data dictionaries. Um, autistic people, we use a different um, language sometimes. We have our own words for, I mean, you guys are all neurotypical for a start. Um, it's not like dissing you or anything, it's just I think differently to you. Um, and when we use those words, when we speak to a clinician, they interpret it differently and write down their neurotypical view. So they've already mistranslated what we said, so the instructions go all awry. So I, I think a robo um, doctor or somebody that takes account of the different um, lifetime conditions that use their own in-house words, then you might get somewhere better with clinical care as well. So I'm just, just saying I think you need to think out of the box, because I've only understood 60% of the stuff in the room. The mathematical stuff is way past what I can understand. But I'm just you know, putting it out there. <laughs> One thing I, I think we have already done, not quite in the same way that you described with Rana. So within Northwest Island, this comes back to the interoperability. There is a joined up electronic patient all by patients, and it's, we're using the patient knows best to keep it You're right, that still currently relies on the uh, manual input of diagnosis, medication automated entry of some of those and um, so but that's sort of, so something like you described is available we do have what you described around a medication passport manual version of that and that's just been did actually try a medical passport Now, having said that, we may have moved on, the banking sector has moved on. Um, some of their... Second point I want to pick up is around um, for our purpose at the moment, so we can understand what's happened. Up. We're doing a piece of work in North West London using this link and we can actually understand where people have different needs and where the services are failing them. Very heterogeneous. There are different states. We need to use a data driven approach to understand. That's the piece of work we are doing. We're looking at that inequality between needs, expectations, and yeah. things around what you described around the patient language. So, um, Emily Barrow, who's a PhD student, very much started this process and now address the paradigm between <laughs> the clinician's view and which they use around the face. You're actually right, there's a, there's a paradigm that just things get lost in the middle and so she's very much addressed came off the bat with there's another program we have called the Initiative on the board. If instant data. And of course the way that we went about it those three or four years ago wrongly was we tried to train patients in what we believe patients what sort of things they should be reporting against and of course that training is the wrong way to do it. We're shifting that paradigm to now let people report in their way is a system happening. We are doing lots of those elements. It's a journey. Obviously, where we want to get to is very much what you what you are getting there. Thank you very much.
uh, the word is or the term that's used is around health and literacy, body language, or you like, um, but that is a are trying to address that. And we are um, very much part of our patient safety centre as the other two centres. Very much on co production. Now, isn't a white middle class man, it's going to all those harder to reach groups like the white men and get their views. to see what practical benefits this could bring to patients. Thank you. I look after a, a patient association with 13,000 patients in, in the borough of Harrow, and we're interested in the future applications of AI to help within primary care. Do you see any practical benefits coming out that could help, for example, the GP, um, bearing in mind, for example, that a typical consultation that they have with a patient is only 10 minutes in duration and the volume of data that a GP would have to go through about a given patient that's about to walk through the door is phenomenal, would take hours and hours to, to study and they just haven't got that time. Is there any way that AI could help that GP? I think a bunch of us can take that. But, so I think what we're talking here really about is how to get the information to the GP when in the time he's seeing you or maybe in the few minutes before you walk into the office to get you that information. Here we really need to talk also about this information that you need to tell the GP that is not clinical data. It may be how, much, how many steps you've taken, what your temperature was, things that are collected in a private domain on your private mobile phone or that your house may know or your car may know and to collect that. And there are a bunch of approaches now being taken uh, from having sort of your private record on your phone that can collect this data and make it available. But I think the challenge that we're facing here at the moment is that non-clinical data is non-standardized. And if you just compare different phone companies, they will have different ways of assessing the amount of distance you've walked. And so one of the big questions, for example, is real-world walking speed as a measure of many different disorders of, of progression of, of, of how they approached. So here it's also about training the GPs uh, together in how to read out this information, but also finding common standards of, of relying on this highly variable, highly difficult to interpret data sometimes. And so there are a number of approaches and projects in, on, ongoing in that, and I think one of the most interesting is in the Bay Area. Uh, that I've seen, uh, so this is run in San Francisco, where um, actually this, these feeds are live updated on a daily basis with the registered GP you're at, and they may even evaluate you, so they have a dashboard, just like we've seen before, that may have evaluate you, why don't you come in, why have you suddenly stopped walking so much, and things like that. So this is about proactive care. But I think we need to be thoughtful of how we can do that. In the US, certainly it's possible because it's part of the healthcare system is private, so people can buy into that. I think here we're more protective of our patients, and we should be. And so how do we bridge them? That's an evolution, a dialectic that needs to happen. So there are, there are lots of initiatives that are going on. There's lots of company interest. Um, don't have the opportunity to recall chronology <coughs> that happens, that provides a risk because of course we know from a lot of the behavioural science research that you put diagnosis go quick that they can't get out of their head. And that's where decision support I think AI or machine learning is obviously kept changeably. A lot of the risk prediction tools What it often does is, if based on the coded data that's entered by the GP, diagnosis isn't ranked according to the most likely diagnosis, it's just ranked at 10 or 12, 
even if the probability of it is very low at 1%, they of course then start deferring on that. Where we go is with the work that Brendan Delaney is taking forward is actually changing the probability of the diagnosis based on the symptoms as they are entered in that one consultation, or more importantly, which happens quite often, is patients come with potentially related symptoms, think about the lung cancer type one or the myeloma, and of course, in that two-month period, which it normally takes the GP to recognise, it's actually even pattern recognition, we can short cancer. You know those symptoms were potentially unrelated, that is the most likely diagnosis. That's where we're going with it, and that very much comes to the AI learning health system data that goes in, the system starts to learn from it, you've got to change the behaviour, learn from that new data that's coming, it's that continuous cycle, where we go in. I'm excited about this, any projection of time scales? So the, the system I've just described, um, we've done, Brendan, so say hi to the Royal Week, uh, Brendan's done the work across Europe for the prototype, we've just got a CO. Demonstrate the feasibility. the analytics bit in the background to assess the impact of the patient pathway. Um, Thank you, very exciting. Thank you. If I could just ask you a question, that one of the things that we find very looking at very dependent on For instance, if you look at people in hospital, look out in the real world, that doesn't really exist. Most people you deal with that, particularly if you're Yeah, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, well, we had looked at that, um, that context. I don't, I don't think we have, but again, you're, what you're coming back to is that sort of interaction between human Those associations, of course, are uh, learned, and we have learned behaviours. And I think I and as a, a workshop yesterday. Understanding that when AI gives you one answer day one, and then day two, learn from the data, how do we understand why is, why is it giving you a different, give different answer? Because I'm processing information in the same way, so I would get to the same answer both times. And so that's the behavior I think we've got the computer and human interface to think about. So I think that's why we need to think about closing the loop in the AI system if the human is as important. So uh, this is a project we did eight years ago. So this is pre-Twitter times, just to give you a time scale of how, much, how long that was ago. Where we asked people to, we gave people apps on their iPhones so that we got sponsored from a company and we asked to record their activities. Trivial stuff, in those days it was an exciting thing. Um, and basically we asked people, uh, you know, the system then prompted the person, I think you're running, or I think you're sitting in a bus. And in the first, what we did is we said, you're in a bus, right? And then people were upset to the level that, no, you were not in the bus, they were, you know, lying in bed or something. And this AI was confronting them as, this is a fact, correct? And they didn't like that. And it is a small change in the interface that we introduced to asking the question, are you in a bus now? suddenly the response rate doubled on, on people providing that feedback. So it's really about engineering the interaction with AI. You know, that it's not a judgmental system. You're not judged by it. You're not delivered with a truth that may be counterfactual and disrupts the trust. You need to build that trust relationship, just like any doctor learns how to build a trustful relationship with his patient and how to compose and comport oneself to establish that trust. And I think we need to think about these psychological aspects when we're designing these type of interactions. Uh, yeah, I come back to you a little bit on that. It's not just um, psychological. 
I mean, most doctors will make that error. They'll think, well, if you're a... <coughs> continually a mistake to... You will think that that's real. Most doctors, if you, if you put this... I found a really good... <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's not something that you can generalize outside the context. I think that's the worry that I have about some of the systems, that if you don't have the context, it might make it. Your concern is about the confounding of correlation with causality. It's sort of that, but it, it's, it's to do with selective samples, which are not typical of the world. As it right. I think in that, sp yeah, I think in that space, I think if you look into probabilistic machine learning, there's a lot of work on how to deal with unbalanced priors that you may have for one or the other, and how to combat bias that you may experience. So, I have confidence in those statistics, in the sense, in the statistical theory, that you can start to address these challenges. Yeah. I think this is all very exciting, and I think you're point is very valid and my question is a little bit different. How data literate do we all need to become in this world that you are describing? Because I work in this area and I see experts not understanding the difference between, for example, but PCA won't give them the right thing. We're expecting now everybody to be able to understand what results they are getting. Are they valid? Do they need to question it? So are we thinking about re-educating everybody in a more, in a different way. So I don't know how broad your question was, whether it was just about the doctors, but if you look, for example, into the Chinese AI strategy paper that came out, uh, which is very forward-looking and very aggressive, uh, they're saying that AI needs to be taught at primary school. Now, what AI means is here understanding that there's something that can learn to make a decision from some data and what the pitfalls are of dealing with this data. And so I think this is a very forward-looking way of thinking about that. And I think we also need to become all more data aware. I mean, looking at my teenage self, I still can't believe that people would put up all the private information on Instagram, Snapchat, or, or whatever. But it, it does happen. And I think now we're seeing slowly a revolution of that. But I think a lot of this for concerns around data and the awareness of data is ultimately what the consumers want. Because for many, many things I've seen so far, that convenience trumps everything else. I think that's we true. Have to do that. yeah. And ultimately, we have to decide to, to but, talk about But I think at university, we're already too late. Yeah, yeah, you've given up away all, everything already. You signed up for everything by that stage. I think we really need to start in school. terms, but a lot of sort of the, I really need this, but um, the sort of the more common medical terms, and I was wondering if you've run into challenges using publicly available but not medically trained things like word to vec in, in, in your methods here, um, and I'm wondering if using those has led you to worry at all about losing some of the medical granularity that you might expect in these text reports. Oh, in, in the sort of in the in the graph representations that you were showing us there, I, I was. Just, yeah, just because it's not necessarily like trained on specifically on, on medical terminology. I noticed there was sort of in the clusters you were showing us a, a lack of some of the more specifically medical stuff, and. 
Okay. Okay, that, that's that's what I was curious about. Whether that improves significantly, you know, when you actually, you know, in this case, have a large order of records to retrain, uh, you know, both numerical and more records. Um, and it does definitely improve the well. Average number. and then apply that to the shorter sentence. Thank you. Uh, this is a question regarding, you know, taking you out of the NHS to, um, say, developing countries where I'm looking into referrals surgical referrals from district level hospitals to secondary or tertiary care. And one of the things that we find is that risk aversion of physicians uh, as a cause for more than necessary referrals. And just listening to your lectures, I find that quite an exciting opportunity where in a simplistic manner that we can actually start looking into is, is like introducing simple AI, you know, uh, logarithms by which it can predict or help physician to take on risk, and whether how do you see the opportunity of that happening uh, in such uh, limited resources or limited um, you know decision making systems? So, okay, so I have a, I have a problem uh, with 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 trying to simplify the data at the, at the primary care and then how to pass it on is that very often the people who collect the data don't have a sense of the challenges with measuring data. And I've done this with every poor one of my poor GPs. When they take my blood pressure, they write down minuscule the exact numbers, 122 to 81, and ask them, why do you write the one? It doesn't matter whether it's 80 or 85, you can't measure that. And it, you know, it, that con ends up with me convincing them to take three repeated measurements and then seeing how variable it is. <laughs> now, the challenge for that is that, of course, the, the standard way of measuring trigger certain thresholds, and if you do certain things, you, you trigger certain thresholds. And, and if the machine learning system is not accepting that or is aware of how variable your measurement method is, because you may use different tools, then, then you're propagating from this very start highly noisy data. And I think that's, that's a barrier to acceptance because people will, will not feel confident that, they, that, that the system that's accusing them of being more granular than they actually think they are is operating on them. I'm not going to quite answer your question, but I think I am going to answer your question. So I think it's a valid point from a slightly different perspective. A lot of low income countries a lot of how harm is happening because we're not recognised tuberculosis, for instance. Everyone with a off some night sweats, you should get general. The way I've understood that it takes to work, of course, is people are working off treatment with algorithms like the WHO ones. Of course, they've been drawn up based on clinical expertise, as opposed to using a data driven individual patient algorithm. There is the opportunity to make standard night or algorithms for people to do. Use a data-driven approach to prove the diagnosis in areas where often there is a misdiagnosis. And I understand that. And start to use it in, in that way. There's a big need. I mean, I think one of the key benefits of machine learning technology is that we can use smart software to work off poor sensors. So the amount of things of diagnostics in a rudimentary level that you can do in your smartphone is actually staggeringly fantastic. But we need to be aware that these sensors are a lot less accurate. Yeah. Well, would that sort of, in 
enable you to classify or stratify risk at the primary care level. Exercise. So a good example is in this country, you know, NICE has re redefined the probability of a cancer diagnosis and therefore referral from the primary care level. I can't quite remember the odds ratio. But three percent risk of cancer, you need to be referred as a team. What do you set as your but these are ultimately policy decisions. These are policy, yeah. Just like having, yeah. say, a stroke ward in, on every street corner. You can do it. You will save a few more people. Yeah. But at what cost? Uh, but, yeah. But I think also, but using an individual data-driven approach to define the risk, inverted commas, is where we are going to, as opposed to taking the risk profile guidelines, which is across a population, of course. Within that population, you've got such.